Thank you for letting me have a chance to speak and talk with you about our Cocos programming model. So what is Cocos? Cocos is a portable performance shared memory programming model for node level parallelism. It's a C++ library. It's not a language extension or a new language. And the goal with Cocos is to let users write their algorithms once and be able to run on many different architectures, all this, this many core problem, um, by simply recompiling your code for your target architecture or backend. Um, we do this by shielding users from needing to know any um, native programming model uh, uh, details as well as architecture specific details. And um, very importantly, Coco solves what we call the, the data layout problem. I'll talk more about this in the session after lunch, but Cocos does this by using multi-dimensional arrays with architecture-dependent layouts. And the, the key point here is that to get performance across these different architectures, whether you're running on the CPU, on the host side, or on a GPU, um, the memory access pattern must depend on the architecture in order to um, not just get portability, but performance portability. So, Cocos is part of what we're um, calling the Cocos ecosystem. Today we'll be talking about Cocos Core, the Cocos Core library, which sits on top of the std threads, OpenMP, CUDA, and Rockham backends. The Cocos Core library contains useful algorithms and containers that are Cocosware. Built on top of Cocos, there's a separate um, uh, code base called Cocos Kernels, which contains um, a growing number of sparse and dense linear algebra, graph, and tensor kernels. And Cocos and Cocos kernels, those are ma maintained independently on GitHub, but they're also packages within the, the Trilinos library. Across the software stack, you can use the Cocos tools, and these are Cocos-aware profiling and debugging tools that let users provide names to your allocations and your kernels. And this is actually really, really helpful when you're debugging or profiling your outputs so that it's more manageable, especially when the alternative might be a bunch of mangled, really um, unreadable C++ symbol names. And then there's the Cocos support, which is our um, application support and developer training. We maintain an active presence on GitHub where users can um, ask questions, submit uh, um, uh, issues about bugs that they encounter or feature requests. And we also have a Slack channel for communicating with users, users uh, in more of a real-time setting. So the Cocos core library that I'm gonna talk about um, consists of abstractions for parallel execution. So one category would be the execution pattern. How is the, the execution to be um, structured? So we have a parallel for, parallel reduced, parallel scan. There's execution policies that allow us users to express how the pattern should be executed. Is this flattened parallelism? Are we gonna use thread teams? This sort of thing. There are execution spaces, which um, allow users to express where the computation should be uh, where the, the pattern should be executed. So should this be executed on the host, on a CPU, on a KNL, uh, on the GPU? To enable the abstractions, Cocos also provides an abstract data structure called a view. And this allows users to control the, the memory layout, the memory space, which is where the, the data allocation should reside, as well as memory traits to indicate how the data should be accessed, for example, by through streaming, atomic, or restricted access. So to match up the, the abstraction terminology with an actual piece of code, this is a snip that might come from, for example, a finite element code where you're doing a loop over some number of elements, and then within each of those elements, you're doing a loop over the, the quadrature points and performing some sort of calculation. So the, the execution pattern or the pattern, we're referring to the structure of the computations. In this case, the keyword for here is indicating the pattern that, that we see the execution policy, which is highlighted in green, is gonna to refer to how the, how the computations are executed. Here, we're just going through um, sequentially, um, uh, uh, index by index. And then the computational body, highlighted in purple, is gonna to refer to the, the actual code that's gonna be um, performing a computation of each, um, each iteration or unit of work. We say that the pattern and policy drive the computational body. So just as a kind of high level reference for some of the, the API um, calls within Cocos, we'll discuss some of these today that we have time for. For parallel loops, there's a parallel for. For reductions, there's a parallel reduce. We're gonna talk about something called a range policy, which is a, a way of the um, user controlling some um, aspect of the execution policy. For tightly nested loops, there's a multi-dimensional range policy. We won't have time to go into that in detail today, but that's also available in the, um, the longer full day tutorials. For non-tightly nested loops, and if you want to exploit um, more parallelism through like hierarchical parallelism, Cocos provides a team policy. Um, 
there's also a tasking pattern. And for the, the, um, data, the data structure abstraction, we're gonna talk about the view and how to copy between a device and host. The execution spaces that are supported, I think I mentioned this already, are the, there's a serial execution space, threads, OpenMP, CUDA, and Rockham, which is a fairly new experimental backend, but we've been getting help from uh, the, the, uh, the AMD guys getting this implemented. So getting started on the tutorial, um, this is more specifically prerequisite knowledge for the exercises themselves, but there's some assumption of um, some uh, knowledge of C++. And today what we're going to cover is simple 1D data parallel computational patterns, um, showing you how to decide where the code is to run and where the data should be placed, and um, how to manage the data access patterns for performance portability. We're not gonna have time to cover thread safety, scalability, and atomics, hierarchical patterns, multidimensional data parallelism, or the, the tasking pattern, or plug-in points where users can actually extend the, um, the, the layouts to the Cocos views for your own custom memory access patterns. So let's jump into how to use Cocos for parallel patterns. So we have a, a code snip here, maybe this comes from an MD code, where we're looping over some number of atoms, doing some calculation, and then storing that result. So with Cocos, when we put this uh, through a parallel four, what Cocos is gonna do is it's gonna map work to cores, where a unit of work, work is going to be one iteration of the computational body. We're gonna refer to the iteration index here, atom index, to um, identify a particular unit of work. The iteration range, which is the number of atoms, is gonna identify a total amount of work. And so with Cocos, the, with the, the work mapping, what you do is you provide an iteration range, so in this case, you could, that would indicate the number of atoms, and a computational body to Cocos, and then it'll map the iteration indices to the cores, and then run the computational body on those cores. So as a preview of the Cocos API, this would be, the four keyword would be replaced with parallel four. You then pass as your first argument the iteration range, and then as the second argument, the computational body. So that might bring the, the question, how are computational bodies given to Cocos? So we use functors or functor objects as one way of doing this. If you're not familiar with what a functor is, it's essentially um, a struct with an operator parens defined. The operator parens is going to enclose your computational body. So with the Cocos API going um, another step through how you would use this, you would instantiate your functor. We'll get into more details of this functor in a, in a slide or two. And then you call the Cocos Parallel 4, you pass your number of iterations, your iteration range, and then you pass the functor to Cocos. And then work items are gonna be assigned one by one to the functors, where the operator parens of the functor has as its argument the iteration index, and then it encloses the computational body. So as a warning with Cocos, um, concurrency and ordering of the parallel iterations is not guaranteed, so make sure to write an algorithm where you don't have such a, uh, an expectation. Now for passing the data to, um, to the computational bodies, looking back at the original for loop here from the, this MD type SNP, um, if we enclose that computational body within the operator parens, we're gonna need to access data in order to, to make this call to calculate forces, and then we also need to be able to access some atom forces array to, to store the result. So in order to um, be able to access that data, we have to add these data members to the functor. So the functor might look something like this for the, this MD example. Um, it's a struct we'll name as an atom force functor. It's gonna have two data members, the atom forces and then the atom data. We need to add a constructor. Um, oh, and I got a typo here. So this isn't quite complete, but uh, this is a, this constructor would require two arguments for the, the different data members, the atom forces and atom data data members. And then in our operator parens, our argument will be the, the iteration index, and then we enclose the um, computational body there. So then to reproduce this for loop of the, this MD SNP using functors, we instantiate a functor. We need to pass the data members to it, so we pass the atom forces and data arguments to the constructor. Then we call the for loop, and then we replace the computational body with a call to functors operator parens by passing the iteration index to the functor. So with Cocos, the way that this would look then um, to execute the, the parallel pattern, 
we again create the functor, passing in atom forces and data as the members. And then we call Cocos Parallel 4 with the iteration index. The iteration range is your first argument. And then the functor is your second argument where the computational body is enclosed within this operator parens. And the argument there is the, the iteration index. So functors, that can be a bit tedious to rewrite that. Um, and it's not very readable in the code. Um, C++ 11 provides lambdas, which were much more concise and make the code much more readable. Um, a, a lambda is basically a, uh, the compiler auto-generating a functor for you. And so the way the, the lambda looks is in the parallel four here, where we pass our iteration range as our first argument. Instead of passing a functor, we're gonna um, pass a lambda, which uh, in terms of syntax, you have a capture clause, which is what this bracket equals, bracket close means. And then you have your argument, which will be your iteration index, and then enclosed within that is your computational body. So this should basically look like the, um, the operator parens of a functor. Question. So this looks like TBB. Was it intended to look like that for people who use TBB before? TBB, you mentioned? Yeah, enter TBB. That's a good question. That could have been an initial motivation for Cocos, but um, that would have been before I started working on the project. Sorry, I can't answer that directly for you. So when you say number of iterations, yeah, you're not referring to the MD. This is just language for this for code. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's going to be your the number of iterations or the um, the iteration range. That's going to be the the in this case with flattened parallelism. That's going to be the number of things that you're going to parallelize it across. Let's see, so there's a warning when you're using lambdas um, for portability purposes. Um, lambdas have to capture by value for the GPU, and also um, you don't wanna capture containers like std vectors um, by value because they'll copy the container's entire contents, and on top of that, the std vector's not gonna work on the GPU. So um, one drawback is that if you're a fan of the std vector, um, at some point you would need to replace that data structure. Now, in comparison, for example, to how you would do just a simple um, for loop using OpenMP, so we have a for loop over some iteration range with OpenMP. You talked about this yesterday. You simply place a, a pragma OMP parallel for directive above the for loop. With Cocos, it's a bit more invasive. You have to replace the, the for keyword with a parallel for. You discard the, the, uh, the setup, the comparison, and the, the um, increment. And instead, as your first argument to the parallel four, you just pass the, the full iteration range, and then you provide the computational body, in this case, using a, um, a lambda for this demonstration. But um, hopefully, we can convince you, um, especially if you're familiar with some uh, C++ 11 concepts like lambdas or functors, that conceptually, Cocos is not more difficult than OpenMP. It's a bit more invasive to, to make some of the modifications necessary. But um, conceptually, hopefully, it doesn't appear to be any more difficult. Um, oh, question. So I'm a little confused exactly what this functor provides. If you still have a loop body that tells which computations are done throughout each iteration, so so what is the what does the functor actually contain? So the, let me go back to. Let's see. Here, let's look at this functor. Okay, so the functor is going to contain data members. And more importantly, it's gonna contain the computational body, and that's how you pass the, the computational body into Cocos. And then under the hood, Cocos will handle um, mapping work indices to cores. So when you say computational body, those are the actual calculations that are done on the external hardware? Sure, yes. So then what does the loop body do then, if, if that's contained in the functor? So the, the loop body isn't contained within the functor. No, but Exactly, exactly, so what is contained in the loop body? If the computation is in the functor, then what, what's the point of a loop body? It seems like they're the same thing. You, what, when you move to Cocos, you don't have the loop body anymore. You're calling Cocos, for example, here a parallel four. You're passing an iteration range to it and then a functor. And then internally, Cocos will implement this either with, a, depending on the back end that you um, compile for. So OpenMP or CUDA, for example, it'll um, take care of uh, mapping your, your work to cores, essentially, where the, the execution of the body itself will occur, but that's all under the hood. But on slide 17, you show loop body in Cocos. Here. Here. There's a loop body and a functor. 
oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's very, very good uh, eyes on that. This should be the computational body, not the loop body. Oh, I see. So you actually have the closed, pr so that's part of the lambda definition. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was using wording too, too loosely there. Yeah. Um, good catch, though. I'll, I'll get that corrected for this. All right, so for more, um, uh, another example for the, the Cocos um, Parallel Pattern API, we're gonna go through a Riemann sum style numerical integration. So with this code, we're gonna loop over some number of um, uh, equal width rectangles, and we are going to get the, the left endpoint, compute the function's value at that endpoint, and then sum up the, the values of the area of each of those rectangles. So to do this in Cocos, or to parallelize this correctly, you might start by making identifications with some of these abstractions that I was talking about. So first identifying the pattern. Here we have a, a for loop. Identify the execution policy, and then identify the computational body. And so at a naive first pass um, to convert this to code that would run using Cocos, you might replace the, the for keyword with the Cocos parallel for, do the same thing from the last uh, few slides with the MD example where we replace the, the loops setup um, comparison and, and uh, increment with just the number of the iteration range, and then enclose the computational body within a lambda. But this is gonna cause a couple different problems. The first one may not be quite as obvious, and another one may be more obvious. The first problem is you're gonna actually get a compiler error here because lambda is captured by value, and so in this case, the total integral value is gonna be treated as const. We can't increment it. So as a first way of getting around that, we could create a pointer to the address of total integral and then, pass, and then use the pointer within the, the parallel for. Because we're not changing the address of the pointer, so it's staying const, we're changing the contents of what the, the pointer is pointing to. So that gets us past that first problem, but leads us to another problem that um, may have been the, the more obvious case, which is that uh, this, code as written will most likely result in race conditions. So you could have the first thread loading a value um, for the, the total uh, integral pointer, incrementing it. While thread one is doing that, or while thread zero is doing that, thread one may load the same value for total integral pointer and increment. And instead of the two of those being summed together, thread one will stomp over the value that, that uh, thread zero had written. So the, the root problem here is that we're actually using the wrong pattern with this four by simply just replacing the four with a parallel four. We actually wanna do a reduction here where we're gonna combine the results contributed by um, all the parallel work that's going on simultaneously. So if you were to do this with OpenMP, um, it would look something like this. With Cocos, it'll look like this where um, instead of the four, we're now gonna call Cocos's parallel reduce it's gonna look pretty similar to the parallel four in terms of what arguments are passed. The first argument is gonna be the iteration range. The second argument, a functor or a computational, uh, or a, a lambda to, to um, enclose the computational body. And now we have to pass a third argument, which is gonna be the final reduced value. That's gonna be the value that all the, the results are summed into. So to go into more detail about this, um, using lambdas, if we enclose the computational body within a lambda, um, the arguments for the lambda, you require an extra argument. You're gonna need this um, uh, value to update argument. And that's gonna be a thread private value that's gonna be managed by Cocos for accumulating um, the, the threads partial sums, for, in this case, partial sums for the, uh, for the reduction. And then under the hood, Cocos will accumulate all those partial sum value to update thread private values into the, the total integral value. So I mentioned that this was a parallel reduce for sums, which is the default that Cocos uses, but the parallel reduce um, can be customized for um, either by data type or by the reduction operator. For example, mins, maxes. Cocos provides some of these reducers, um, but users are also able to customize this, but that's something that we won't have time for today. But if you look at the Cocos Wiki, there's examples of that, and if you have questions, of course, um, I could talk with you about that offline. Yes? What data types does the reduce operation work for? Any data types when you um, write your own sum operator, for example? Um, if you customize it, it should work for the data types that, that you customize for. 
So at, at a very basic level, POD types and then arrays of POD types, but you can customize within your, your functor to, to use different data types. Um, we didn't cover the parallel scan pattern, but it supports exclusive and inclusive prefix sums. And I didn't talk about tag dispatch, and so tags are a way of allowing you, in a, a case where you may have some um, really large functor where you might have multiple kernels that you want to, to put it through, um, instead of having to do some boilerplate copy-paste of functors to support the different kernels, the operator parens can receive a, an optional first argument called a tag that lets you pick different kernels to execute when you pass it to the parallel for. Yes? Yeah, can you use um, um Capture by reference into mounted expression. You <laughs> not on the GPU, I don't think. But um, what I'm going to show you in a second here is Cocos actually provides a macro that'll do the right thing to make sure that it compiles properly in in a portable way for for a uh, host or device code. But um, on the host, you you could use a, a capture by reference if you wanted to to do it that way as well. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the view data structure. And this is gonna be the way for allowing you to, to copy um, data back and forth between the host and GPU and to write a portable code and um, hopefully a, a single code that can be compiled and run on the different architectures. So here's a code snip as kind of a, I guess, a thought experiment. Um, this is a code snip for a Daxby. And if we wanted to run this on a GPU, we're gonna run into problems right now. So let's say I compiled with CUDA enabled as my execution space. This parallel four will compile so that this computational body is executed in parallel on the GPU, but there's gonna be a problem. The X and Y values, um, these are allocated on CPU, so they reside in CPU memory, and the GPU is not gonna be able to access that memory um, when trying to, to execute the, the kernel operation there. So we need some way for storing the, the information and communicating it back and forth to the GPU, and so we're gonna do this using views. Yes? So for this example, when you compile the code, will the compiler uh, throw some kind of warning, or? I don't think it'll throw a, a warning. I think you'll get a, a runtime error, some sort of sake fault, because it's trying to access inaccessible memory. So the view, um, this data structure, it's a lightweight templated C++ class. Um, it's gonna contain a pointer to the array data and a little bit of metadata. This metadata is gonna be used, for example, for mapping your multi-dimensional indices to memory locations. And the, there's multiple template parameters, but the uh, required template parameter you have to provide is the data type. So at a kind of high level, what would almost get this running for the GPU is instead of having your allocations um, on the CPU using uh, malloc or new or something like this, if you create a Cocos view where your first template parameter is a uh, double star, that would be your data type, and then you create views for X and Y, when you compile this for the GPU, um, the, the data allocations for X and Y are gonna be on the GPU at this point. So if you executed the parallel four, this computational body would almost work on the GPU. There's actually gonna be another problem if you've written some CUDA code. Um, when you have functions that you're calling on on the, on the GPU, they have to have certain markings. So you saw the, the global marking when you're writing your kernels to, to run on the GPU. If you have a, um, a function that's being called within the kernel, it needs a, a device or a device to host marking. And so that's something that's missing here, but we'll, I'll go over a Lambda that provides that for you. Um, but the point is that views are like pointers, so you wanna copy them in your functors. So you wanna to capture by value. So an, as an overview, um, going more in depth into the, the, the API for the view. Um, it's it's a, a abstraction for a multi-dimensional array of zero or more dimensions. So if you have zero dimensions, that would just represent a scalar. If you have one dimension, that would be a vector. Two dimensions, that would be a matrix, for example. The number of dimensions has to be fixed at compile time, but the size of those dimensions doesn't have to be known at compile time. They can be known at compile time or at runtime. And also these multidimensional arrays, they're rectangular, they're not ragged. So as a more in-depth example um, going through this API, if we wanted to create a Cocos view with three um, runtime dimensions, we'd create the view with a double star, star, star as our data type. The view's name is data, 
the first argument to the view is a label, so a string is a label, and then the three runtime uh, dimensions. So that label argument, that can be a little bit annoying at first, but as soon as you start um, trying to, to debug or profile code, um, you'll be really grateful that you have something like this because it makes it a lot more readable and it makes it a lot easier to map your, your kernels and your allocations back to the actual code itself. As another example, if we have a view with runtime dimensions and compile time dimensions, let's say one compile time dimension, then we declare the view as a double star star bracket um, compile time dimension, then create the, the view data. First argument is label, and then two arguments this time for the runtime arguments, and so on and so forth if you have one runtime and two compile time or all compile time arguments. So as a note here, um, the runtime size dimensions must come first. This isn't a Cocos requirement directly, but actually because of the C++ language, if you were to intermingle the two of those, you'd get some sort of incomplete type um, error messages. So the life cycle of, of the view, um, allocations, those only happen when explicitly specified when you create the view. There's gonna be no hidden allocations. Copy construction and assignment are shallow like pointers. So you pass the views by value, not by reference. Um, the view has a reference counting mechanism, so you aren't gonna be responsible for managing your data yourself. It'll take care of that for you with automatic deallocation when the view goes out of scope. And from this information, you might recognize that the views are gonna behave a lot like a shared pointer if you're used to shared pointers from C++. So another example with creating views and um, kind of um, demonstrating some of the shared pointer-like behavior. If I create two views of data type double star, A and B, first argument is gonna be the label, the second argument is the runtime dimension. First, we set A equal to B. Next, we create a, another view, C, where we're gonna create it by copy construction, passing B to it. We set A of zero, A of zero equal to one, B of zero equal to two, C of zero equal to three, and then we're gonna print A of zero. So with the, the comment here that views behave like shared pointers, what's a of zero going to print? It's gonna print three. And the reference count um, of each of these views is also gonna be three, because they're all gonna be pointing to the same data. The views are different, they're gonna have slightly different metadata. In this case, they're gonna have different uh, labels, but the views are gonna point to the same allocation. So now I'm gonna move on to execution and memory spaces. This is what lets you provide um, or control where the memory, where the, the pattern is going to be executed and where the data is going to be allocated. So starting with the, another thought experiment, I guess, we have two sections of code. In this first section, we have some MPI reduce call. We're gonna open a file and then call some function. And then we have a call to Cocos Parallel 4 and this second section of code is wrapped around the computational body of that parallel four that's gonna execute in parallel. So the obvious question, where will section one be run, the CPU or the GPU? Obviously that's gonna run on the CPU because those are all host functions. The more um, interesting or maybe less clear question is where will section two be run on the CPU or GPU? And more importantly, how do you control that? Because there's no clear way of knowing where this is gonna execute at this point. So execution spaces are gonna provide the means for how you control where this executes. But at this point, um, if you were to compile this code, the section two code, that's going to run on the default execution space. So when you compile your code, you, can, you compile for a, a target architecture um, or backend. So if we compile this with CUDA, by default, CUDA is gonna be our default execution space. If I compile this with OpenMP as the backend, by default, OpenMP is gonna be the, the execution space, and so this would execute on the host. So execution spaces, these are gonna be um, what we're referring to as like the place where the code's going to run. The execution spaces supported by Cocos are the serial, threads, OpenMP, CUDA, and Rockham execution spaces. And so going back to this thought experiment again, um, we've already talked about where the, the red code's going to run. That's always gonna run on the host. So where will the parallel code be run on the CPU or GPU? It's going to run um, with the, uh, the default execution space. So to control this execution space, instead of letting Cocos do some default thing based on how you compile it, you're going to be able to 
to explicitly control through a range policy where the, where the code should be run. That's gonna be your means for expressing where the, where the code should execute. So I'm gonna actually start at the bottom call here. So we have a parallel four. We provide an iteration range and then a lambda to encapsulate the computational body. This is the default thing we've been doing so far. This code, when compiled, would execute based on the way that you, uh, uh, the default execution space or the architecture that you compiled for. If you want to customize this and control that, instead of the number of iterations or your, your iteration range as your first argument, you provide a range policy as your first argument. It's one of its uh, uh, template parameters is the execution space, which could be CUDA, Serial, OpenMP, Rockham, Threads, and the range policy requires two arguments, the starting index and the end index. Another requirement for enabling the execution space, so let's say that execution space in the first example up here was actually Cocos CUDA, but I compile with OpenMP as the enabled backend or as the, the um, an architecture like KNL where it'll only compile host code. If that's the case, I'm gonna get a compiler error because I didn't compile with that execution space enabled. So if you're going to explicit, if you want to explicitly tell Cocos where that this, this should be executed, then you also need to compile the code appropriately to run um, for, for that execution space. In the um, exercises, I'll show you that there's calls called uh, Cocos Initialize and Finalize that are required um, at the start and end of, of any uh, block of code where you're going to use Cocos, and this is so that the execution spaces can be initialized. And also there's gonna be some macros um, that are required when you want code to, to run on non-CPU spaces. So I'll go into those right now. Like I mentioned before, um, just a moment ago, if you have a function that you're going to compile to run on the GPU that might be called from a GPU kernel, it needs to be marked appropriately with a, either a device marking or a device host marking. So instead of you having to do this and if guard things, Cocos provides some macros that do this for you because the goal here again is so that you can write code using these abstractions and be able to compile it for any of these architectures without having to know any specifics of the, uh, the, the native programming model itself like CUDA. So in a functor, for example, um, where we have our operator parens, we want this to be able to compile and run on host or on the GPU. So we're going to add a, an annotation, a Cocos inline function above that, and that's a macro. If it's compiled for CPU only backends, then it's gonna be simply replaced by the inline word. And if it's compiled for CPU and CUDA um, backends, then it'll be uh, replaced by inline device host. If you don't like using functors, if you like using lambdas, then what you would do is you'd replace the capture clause with a Cocos Lambda macro, and so Cocos defines the, this macro as the um, bracket equal bracket for value in the case of CPU only compiled code, and bracket equal bracket, device marking for CPU and code, and a CUDA enabled code. So for um, a, a motivating example here, I guess to demonstrate um, some nuances of, of memory spaces. We're creating a, a view, view double star as our data type. So we give it a labeled data, and then we pass a, a dimension as the, first, as the second argument, since this is going to be a view with one runtime um, dimension. We're gonna do some initialization of the view, and then we're gonna call a Cocos parallel reduce. We're, we're gonna sum up the array, the we're gonna sum up the um, values of that array. We pass an explicit range policy templated on some example execution space. This isn't an actual execution space. This is just um, a, a placeholder where we'll talk about specifics. Then we pass two arguments, the starting index and the end index, and then the computational body. Here we're doing this with uh, a lambda, and instead of having the capture clause, we're using the Cocos lambda so that this code will be portable. It's a parallel reduce, so our first argument is an iteration index. The second argument is going to be our thread private value for partial sum accumulation. And then the parallel reduce requires the third argument, which is the, the, the value for the final reduced result. 
So as a question, where is the data stored? Where is the data, where is the allocation for data being made? On the GPU, on the CPU, both, neither? And again, if this isn't clear, it's because there's no information here that's um, explicitly provided to indicate where this should be uh, occurring. So with the view, the way that we've written this here, providing just the first required data type template parameter, we haven't provided any information explicitly about the memory space for where the, the allocation should occur. So what that means is when you compile um, your code, at, depending on the backend that you have enabled, so let's say for concrete sake that we're compiling code with CUDA enabled as the backend. That means that the data allocation should be on the GPU, so this view by default is gonna allocate the uh, data um, memory on GPU, and then as long as some example execution space is Coco's CUDA, then our uh, parallel reduce um, pattern will execute on the GPU as well. But this code, if that's the case where we have uh, CUDA as our ex execution space, we're gonna run into a problem. Does anyone see what it is? Sorry, it's located on Coco's. Oh, okay, so that's, um, that's a, a good observation. Some is, is allocated on the host. When we pass that to, to the parallel reduce here, um, Cocos will take care of the deep copy for the final result to some. So yes, some does, re some does reside on the host, but that isn't a problem in this case, and I didn't explain that clearly before. But Cocos will take care of the deep copy of the final result into some so that it's available. But you're close, though. What about this first for loop? Where is that going to execute? It's going to execute on the host, because we haven't um, included it in a Cocos parallel reduce. There's no um, this uh, kernel isn't going to compile for anything besides host code, so we're gonna get inaccessible memory um, errors here. It's trying to assign some sort of value read from a file into memory that's on the GPU, which is not allowed in this case. So to control this, um, one way of controlling this is through the use of memory spaces in order to allow you to explicitly provide where you, where you want um, your allocations to reside. So the memory space, that's gonna be your place to put the data. And every view, it's gonna store data in a memory space that's set at compile time unless you explicitly um, provide a, a memory space. So you provide the memory space as a second template parameter the memory spaces that are available are host space, CUDA space, CUDA UVM space, there's CUDA host spin space, there's um, HBM space for high bandwidth memory on KNLs, for example. And each execution space is gonna have a default memory space identified with it. So obviously, if CUDA is the backend you have enabled, that makes CUDA your execution space, by default, um, CUDA space is going to be your memory space that's identified with that. If you are compiling where you have OpenMP enabled as your backend, that's gonna be um, code that would compile for the CPU, then by default, host space would be the memory space that's identified with that. So if you don't provide a space to your, to your view, um, the view's data is gonna reside in the default memory space of the default execution space. So like I was already mentioning um, with the, the previous click, if we compiled with OpenMP as our backend, as our execution space, the default memory space that's gonna be identified with that is gonna be host space. And so the allocation would reside on the, the host side. So we have a couple examples um, to demonstrate this, this API. So if we create a view, type double star, and we explicitly provide host space as the, the memory space, this will be called host view, and then we provide constructor arguments. So it would require a label and two runtime dimensions. The data, the memory will be allocated on the CPU side, as well as the metadata of the view, which like I mentioned, contains some information for mapping multidimensional indices into, into memory locations. If we do almost the same thing, but we use CUDA space as our memory space, the memory allocation is going to reside on the GPU but the metadata is still on the CPU. So that might seem a little bit confusing, 
So I want to go through the anatomy of a kernel launch. So you would, if you declare a view and uh, your data is allocated based on the, the memory space that's provided, so here we're providing CUDA, um, CUDA space as the, the memory space. We're creating some view V past the label, the runtime dimension, and so the allocation occurs on, on the device. The metadata is gonna be on the, on the host, however. Then we have a parallel four that we call with our iteration range, and in this case, we're using a lambda body, but um, lambda body, that's basically an auto-generated functor. What's happening is when you, um, when the, the functor is gonna be auto-generated, it's gonna have a member for the view. And so the view is gonna be passed as a member, V is gonna be passed as a member to this functor. The functor has a data member V now. And then when you launch your parallel call, the parallel four in this case, the functor is actually gonna be copied to the device. Since the functor is copied to the device, the functor has a view member, so it now has a copy of the metadata. So now the metadata during the, um, the, the execution of the kernel is gonna be available on the GPU. And then after the kernel completes, the copy of the functor in that memory is going to be released. And so as a note, there's no deep copies of the array data. Um, views are like pointers, so no hidden deep copies. Um, questions? I should pause for a second. I'm talking kind of fast. Okay, so I want to go on to a couple um, examples of this interplay between execution and memory spaces. So with this first example, we have a view. It's going to be of an int star data type and our memory space, we're passing CUDA to it. So I'm at, in this case, we're actually passing CUDA instead of CUDA space. CUDA is an execution space, but identified with the execution space is a default memory space. And so with the CUDA execution space, there's the CUDA space memory space that the view will be able to, uh, to extract from that. So we create this view device. Then we call a parallel four, and we do some operations where we store some, some information to, to this device view. And so based on that um, last slide where I went through the anatomy of a kernel launch, the, the view's memory allocation is going to occur on the GPU, but its metadata is on the CPU. But then when we call the parallel four, when the functor, which is gonna be auto-generated by the compiler for this lambda, um, is created, it's gonna have this dev member, which will contain the metadata, and that's gonna be copied across to the GPU um, when, when the, for the, for execution of this kernel. So now if we have two views where we create a view um, with its memory explicitly um, uh, expressed in the CUDA space and another view where its memory is explicitly told to reside in host space and then run this parallel for let's say that we compile this with CUDA enabled as the back end, we're gonna run into a problem. Does anyone see what the problem is? Okay. So I'll point to the picture here. When this dev view is uh, created, the memory allocation is gonna be on the GPU. When the host view, which is templated on host space is created, its memory allocation is going to occur on the host side. When we call the parallel four with the functor, when the functor is um, copied over to the GPU, we're gonna have a copy of the metadata of the device and host views copied over there. However, when we have this host of I equals something, we're trying to access memory on the host from the GPU, which is not allowed. So this is the part that causes a problem. Um, so to, to get around this, and going back to that initial example of summing the array, we might explicitly provide some uh, memory space information to the views. So instead of letting the view do the default thing based on how you compile it, if we explicitly tell it CUDA space, this still doesn't help us because we still have this for loop that's trying to assign something to um, array, but array's memory resides on the GPU. So that's gonna cause a problem. So let's try something different then. Let's 
change the memory space to explicitly be host space. So we're compiling with CUDA enabled as, a, as the backend, for example, and we have now explicitly um, told the view that its memory should be in host space. So at this point, when we run the for loop, we're fine, because array of i, it's accessing memory that's on the host, and we're not gonna run any problems there. But when we go into the parallel reduce, if we explicitly um, tell the, the range policy that we want this to execute on the GPU by passing CUDA as the first template parameter for the execution space, we're gonna run into problems here. Because now, when it tries to access array of indexes uh, memory, that's gonna be an illegal access, since array was now um, uh, templated to have its memory allocation reside on the host. So we need a solution for this, because obviously, like I mentioned, we're, given, we're trying to give a programming model here that um, provides performance portability, so portability being the, the key word here that as of now we're failing to meet. So there's a couple different options. One thing is to use CUDA's UVM space, Another is to use the CUDA host pin space. We're gonna skip that, um, but the, there's extra information about that in the advanced tutorials, or something we call mirroring. So if you were to use CUDA UVM space as your memory space, this will provide a solution because it'll allow you to migrate data between the GPU and host um, through pages, but this happens with a performance hit in, in a lot of cases. Yes? So the previous example, uh, uh, this is just a clarification. I see the value update, uh, that variable, is passed by reference. So, and then it's updated within, yeah, the values you update. It's passed by reference. So, suppose array is in, uh, uh, array is allocated in GPU, but we still can't use value update outside the GPU, can we? No, that's right. Yeah, value to update can't be used outside. That's right. Yes. So there's no kind of an abstraction for data movement as such provided by Cocoa? Oh, there is. I'm getting to that. Yeah. Um, I get maybe I'm meandering a little bit too much with the, the way the slides are structured. Sorry about that. But yes, there there is a, a a pattern also that's um, portable that um, doesn't harm your performance in either case if you compile for host or GPU code. Yes. Uh, question about slide 41, uh, one of the previous ones. So. Okay. How does the parallel core know here that it's executed? It's supposed to execute on the GPU and not the host. Okay, that's a good question. Isn't that the range policy that's missing or something? Or? So let's, um, to be concrete, let's say that I compile this with CUDA as the um, backend. So that's our execution space. So like you mentioned, the um, range policy is missing here. So we're letting Cocos do the default thing based on the way the code was compiled. So if the code's compiled with CUDA as the backend that's enabled, then CUDA will also be the default execution space. So we haven't told it explicitly, but that's the default thing that happens here. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Oh, okay. okay. So one option to get this code to work um, and allow for some portability or data mig migration would be to use CUDA UVM space. But since that can come at a performance hit, we want something that's more performant. And so we're, we have this uh, concept called mirrors that we use in Cocos. So a mirror of a view is an equivalent array, but possibly residing in, different, in a different memory space. So it's essentially gonna have the same metadata, um, but the allocations will reside in, in different spaces. So the schematic here um, shows some of the, the CUDA API calls. So let's say um, we have a view of type double star, star, and then we pass an explicit space as the second, an explicit memory space as the second template parameter. Um, to reduce typing, this has been type def. A type def is ba basically an alias, so we have view type as an alias for this view. We're gonna create a view type, templated on whatever uh, memory space that is, called view, and then to create a mirror of this view, we're gonna create a host mirror called host view by assigning it the result from this Cocos create mirror view function call where we pass the view as the first argument. So let me unpack this a little bit. Um, let's go into concretes again. So let's say that we compile with CUDA as our, our backend. That makes CUDA our default execution space. Identified with CUDA is going to be the CUDA space as the, the uh, default um, memory space. 
So let's say that space here is CUDA space. This view that we're creating, um, been unclear about the arguments here, but we would pass a label and we would pass two runtime dimensions where that data allocation is going to reside on the GPU. So our data is here. When we create the host view, it's going to basically be a mirror of this same view, but the data allocation is gonna reside on the host. Joe, question or just stretch? Okay, no, it's okay, go ahead and keep stretching, yes. How do you guarantee sync Very good question. We provide a deep copy call. So I'm gonna go through the, uh, the pattern for using this, but we provide a deep copy call for, for synchronization and, and uh, memory transfers. So yeah, here's, here's how you would use this um, mirroring pattern. So you're gonna, you would first create a view um, in some memory space. So again, we're using an alias for the view type, but the view type is gonna be a Cocos view in this example of data type double star templated on some memory space. In this case, we're being explicit about it. If it's not explicit, it does the default thing based on the way you compile your code. So we create a view. Next, you create a host view by using the create mirror view function. Um, you can also use auto here, so if you don't like to um, type that much, if you did auto host view equals Cocos create mirror view of view, this will create um, another view with its data uh, it's memory allocation residing in host memory. So next, you might want to initialize that host view. For example, maybe reading some data from a file or something like this. And then you want to migrate that data to the GPU. So you would then use Coco's deep copy call where you would copy the memory from the host view to the, to the device view, I'll call it. So let's say we have um, this deep copy call, the first argument is where we're sending the memory to. The second argument is where it's coming from. And then we launch a kernel that's gonna process the, the um, that's gonna use the view in some sort of computational body. So we have a Cocos parallel four. In this case, we're passing a range policy that's gonna be explicitly um, uh, templated on the execution space that needs to match the uh, memory space for the view, it's going to use it. And also we have to compile Cocos with that backend enabled. So if we told this range policy to run on CUDA, where we pass the CUDA execution space but only compiled with the OpenMP backend, then we're gonna run into trouble because we haven't compiled the code properly. Um, so then we have this uh, Lambda that'll and, um, enclose some sort of computational body that performs some sort of um, uh, operations using the view and storing the results in the view. And then if we need to get the results from that view back to the host, then we call the deep copy again. But in this case, we are copying data from, from the view, that's uh, the device view to the host view. So there's a couple things that might concern you about this as a pattern that I've put out um, for general usage. So. Um, what if the view's in host space? Is it gonna make a copy? So let's say that I compiled with um, OpenMP as the execution space, where space here would be host space, and then go through all this stuff. Does this mean if I'm trying to write this as a, as a portable code, when I compile for either CUDA or GPU, that, in the, that I'm gonna take a, some sort of performance hit for the, the host code in order to enable this code to compile for, for the GPU as well? And the answer is no. Create mirror view, it's gonna allocate data only if the host process cannot access the view's data. So um, if host view can't access view's data, then Cocos will recognize that uh, uh, an allocation for host view's data has to occur. Um, otherwise, host view, it's just gonna reference the same data, basically, um, view and host view, they'll point to the same data, the reference count increases by one, um, and they simply have different metadata in far, as far as the, the actual label used for creating the view. Um, there's another Cocos API called, just called create mirror, not create mirror view, and you would use this if you always actually want to allocate data, if you have a case where you do want the allocation to happen. Um, 
And the point here is that I um, want to remind you that Cocos never performs hidden deep copies. So the pattern that I provided in the previous slide provides you a way um, for, for getting portability in a, in a way that'll allow you to migrate data between the, the, the host and the device in the case where you're compiling for GPU code, if you're using CUDA, for example. But you don't take a performance hit if you're only compiling with the um, with some sort of host execution space enabled, like OpenMP or Threads or Serial. But there's um, four different exercises available in the Cocos Tutorials uh, GitHub repository, and they all build on the same toy example. You're basically doing an inner product. You're doing a, a matvec between A and X, and then a dot product between Y and X to get some final result. Um, the very first exercise, it's written just basically using C++. So the first exercise is just to introduce the Cocos parallel patterns to do this. It'll only compile with uh, the, the host execution spaces at that point. And there's a couple steps that you have to do in order to, to pre prepare the code um, in this exercise to, to execute using Cocos. First, you have to include the, the Cocos header, the Cocos core header. And you need to include calls to Cocos initialize and Cocos finalize. Um, before and after any of the computations occur. And this is to, um, so that you can uh, uh, initialize the, the execution spaces. Yes? Um, so when you call the device kernel, or the, just the kernel, um, can you modify an arbitrary number of views inside of that kernel that you created before? Yes. Yeah. As long as the views um, aren't explicitly templated on like a host space or something like that that would cause, cause a problem in terms of memory accessibility. I guess you free the memory associated with the view later on. So when the, the, when the kernel finishes, you know, a, some sort of parallel pattern call, the, the memory that was allocated for the functor when it's copied over to the device is released. Automatically? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You won't be responsible for any um, uh, tracking of memory or anything like that if you're using the, the Cocos view abstraction. Question. So how does uh, Google handle something like a device-specific thing, like uh, CUDA string, for example? Is oh. that something that's handled at this level or something you guys? So we don't support CUDA streams yet, but that's something that's uh, in progress right now. We're hoping to. What's uh, that? User controls at the API level, Cocos API level? Cocos will provide a mechanism where you can use views, or where you can use streams. It'll be um, nested within the Cocos abstractions, but it's not available yet. It's still in progress. Yeah, good question. We've actually had a lot of requests for that lately. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, heterogeneous computers. So if you have multiple devices, multiple threat models, Cocos manages all the interactions. Oh, this is a very good question. Okay. So if you have, um, so, yeah, multiple thread models. So let's say um, we we can compile Cocos, for example, with with the serial OpenMP and CUDA backends enabled. So when you do this, that Cocos takes care of some default, um, Cocos makes default choices based on the way that you compile the code. So in that case, where you have a host backend or possibly multiple host backends and the CUDA backend enabled, then the default execution space would be the, the CUDA execution space, and that makes the default memory space the CUDA space as well. Um, and so in that case, you would need to, if you wanted the execution of a kernel to occur on, um, on the host side, you would need to explicitly state through either a range policy in the execution pattern that you want this to execute on the host, or um, there's a, a default host execution space that you can, argument that you can provide to it. And if you wanted allocations for, for the memory for the views to exist only on the host for some purpose of your algorithm, then you would provide host space explicitly. Otherwise, um, for portability, you, you um, don't provide these arguments, um, except for cases where they absolutely need to exist in a certain place, and then um, let the, the default thing happen when you compile. So um, let me add one more part. So the, the two threading models that won't work together um, are the threads and OpenMP um, backends. So if you compiled with threads and OpenMP enabled, that would run into problems trying to enter mix the, the threading models on the host side. Okay, cool. question. Yes. OpenCL. We'll talk to Christian. I'm not sure why OpenCL isn't one of the supported backends, but. That's a good question. Yeah. 
That, that's a, yeah, I'd have to ask the PI about, about this, though. Okay. Other questions? Yes. So, although Cookers doesn't do deep copies uh, explicitly, uh, your lambdas may do it, right? If I'm passing some class object and that class object has several vector members of something, internally there may be copies happening. This is like a lambda or C++ artifact, I'm just you know, ensuring. That so, may happen, right? So in the case like, for example, um, with the views, there, there would be a copy of meta metadata between the host and device. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that, that's correct. So there would be. It has to be very careful in what it's actually passing to the view or. Uh, yes. As far as the memory footprint, though, the metadata with the view is going to be really, really small compared to the, the functor itself that's being copied over. Because the, the meta, there's not very much metadata. It's pretty small. The, the actual memory allocation is what's large with the view, except for the case if you have like a scalar view, then you would have more metadata than the actual oh, memory sorry. allocation. If I have a class object, if I want to pass it to your parallel for uh, Lambda, then also I have to be careful, because since it is uh, by value, uh, <coughs> copy by value, I have to very, be, be very careful that I don't pass the entire class yes, or something that, like that. that yes, that, that's a good point. Yes, it's, it's important to be conscientious of this. Um, this last section that I'm going to talk about is going to discuss um, managing memory access patterns for performance portability. So I mentioned this um, uh, data, uh, data access or layout problem, and I'll get into more details about that. Um, so as a quick recap, what I've covered with you so far about the Cocos programming model, we started with data parallel patterns, like how to use Cocos for a parallel for, parallel reduce, and the API involved with that. Um, went through some discussion of the the data structure abstraction that Cocos provides called a view. This allows you to control um, where your data will reside as far as the memory allocation through the um, concept of a, a memory space. We talked a bit about the range policy as a means to control where your um, kernel will execute through the, one of the parallel patterns by providing an execution space and talked a bit about when you compile your code, what some of those default values are if you don't set them explicitly, um, which are determined based on how you compile your code and what backends you enable. So moving on to this next section, we're gonna talk about something called layout. Layouts. And in order to, to discuss this, I'm gonna go through um, a little bit of the, the example that the exercises um, all build from. So the, the exercises um, are an implementation of, of an inner product where you're doing some matvec a times x and then a dot product of, of the result of that matvec and some vector y. So you might see the implementation of this, this code like this where you have an outer for loop over the rows. For each of those rows, you do your um, row i multiplication against the, the vector, store it, and then multiply um, the, the result of that with its corresponding index in the y vector to accumulate your result. So with Cocos, it'll look something like this. This would be the result um, possibly of the first exercise or second exercise. This is actually using views, so it'd be look something more like the, the result of the second exercise, where instead of using the, the for pattern, we're doing a parallel reduce here. We're doing a reduction to get a single value as a result of this. And so in this parallel reduce, our first argument, we're gonna pass a range policy to, so that we can explicitly control what the execution space is, just for demonstration purposes. It doesn't have to be done this way. And we're gonna provide our begin and end um, indices. So from zero to n, this is occurring. So this is going to parallelize this computation over the rows of the matrix. Um, the computational body is then uh, enclosed within, within the lambda. Since this is a parallel reduce, the lambda requires two arguments, the, the iteration index, which we're calling row, and then a thread private value for partial uh, sums in this case, since we're doing a partial reduce with uh, the sum operator, um, called value to update. And then in this lambda, then we're doing the, the for loop that's doing the, the multiplication of the row i of a times the vector x. And so what we're parallelizing over is this multiplication. Each thread is going to be assigned a multiplication of a row of a with the vector x. 
And the final value then, when we complete this operation, is gonna be stored in result. That's the third argument to the parallel reduce. So this begs the question, how should A be laid out in memory? We want this to be um, performant, whether we compile with CUDA enabled as our backend, OpenMP, where this would run on the host. So we have a couple, more than a couple, but a couple um, immediate options that you might consider for, for memory layout or memory access patterns would be to store this in a, in a column major type order. That might be familiar with you if you're a, a Fortran programmer. Um, in Coco's terminology, we'll refer to this as layout left. The reason this is referred to layout left is because if we take the multidimensional indices for a location within the matrix A, I comma J, the way that those are gonna map to locations in memory will have stride one in the leftmost index. Another option um, for, for the um, memory layout could be a, a column or a, a row major type of layout, which if you're a C or C++ programmer, that might be the more natural inclination that you would gravitate towards. And so we call this one layout right in Coco's jargon. And what that refers to, again, is the multidimensional indices ij, where they will be mapped to in, uh, for the, the memory location, will have a stride of one in the rightmost index for, for j. So Cocos exposes this as an option for you through uh, this concept of layout. And it's an optional parameter, template parameter you can pass to the view when you're creating your views. It should be the second um, template parameter. And the options are most commonly layout left and layout right, which correspond to row major versus column major. And like I already mentioned, if you're um, choosing layout left as your, your access pattern, that means that the leftmost index in your multidimensional mapping to memory location is gonna have stride one. And with layout right, your rightmost index is gonna have stride one. If no layout is speci specified, Cocos will um, assign a default layout for the memory space that's used. So the default layout that's chosen for CUDA space is gonna be layout left. The default um, for host space is gonna be layout right. A couple of more comments, I guess, that layouts are extensible. So if you have a layout pattern that you use for, for your kernels or for your algorithms that doesn't match these conventions, the layouts are extensible. And there's also other advanced layout options. There's a layout stride, and there's also, not quite in Cocos yet, but a, a tiled layout option for, for um, partitioning your, your data into tiles. So why is layout left? Why is CUDA layout left in the space layout? That's a good question. I'm gonna get into the details of that. Um, it has to do with um, the caching versus coalesced memory accesses, essentially. So I'll, I'll go into some detail on that throughout this discussion, if that's okay, if I postpone your answer until, I don't know, four slides from now. So to give some motivation for why this is important um, and just uh, some, some performance data to, to emphasize the importance of this, I'm gonna real quickly summarize what would have happened if you were able to go through exercise four, and if not, we can work on this in the, the hands-on section tonight. So in exercise four, you'd be working on this toy example for the, the inner product of A and a of y and ax, and you would have rewritten the code where it's using a parallel reduce instead of the serial for loop. Um, you may have incorporated a range policy so that you could explicitly control what execution space the code will, uh, where the code will execute. Um, any raw pointer allocations would, replaced, would be replaced by Cocos views, so that way we have our portability. You would have added the pattern for creating host mirror views and deep copying, so you can migrate your data back and forth between the host and device. And you could have also added a, a memory space template parameter to control where the view allocations will reside, as well as a layout template parameter. So if you did some tests with those without having much more information about what the, what the difference is in layouts, if you look at performance, Let's start with uh, the red graphs. So the red graphs are gonna indicate performance for this code where we've varied the number of rows of the, of the matrix and the corresponding vector and run performance um, testing on a Pascal 60 GPU. So with the layout left access pattern, the performance measured um, using bandwidth as our, as our performance benchmark, because this is a bandwidth, bandwidth bound kernel, uh, memory bound kernel, we have layout left as our much more performant um, access pattern compared to layout right. And 
if we compile this code for some sort of host architecture, let's say a KNL, the opposite occurs. You see that in the layout right case, we have much better performance compared to the layout left case. Um, similarly for Haswell, if we compile this with Haswell as the architecture um, that's enabled, we see much better performance with the layout right memory access patterns compared to layout left. And so to, to go into some details of why, why this occurs, um, there's a code snip here that might come from a parallel reduce and within this parens operator, we're reading from some memory from some uh, allocation of memory indicated by data, and the the uh, index that we're reading from is is uh, matching with the the iteration index. And so, on the CPU, threads are independent and they can execute at any rate. On the GPU, threads synchronize in groups of 32 called a warp. Um, I think that was mentioned in your last uh, last session. And so what that means is that the threads in that group have to execute instructions together. So when looking at this, you might ask, um, once a thread reads D, does it need to wait? In the GPU case, there's gonna be some, some, synchronization, some synchronization between threads in the warp that occurs. Um, and so what, what that also means is that all the threads in the, in the warp, they have to finish their loads before any thread can move on. So on a CPU, where you might have um, a few cores and they have separate caches, what we want to see then for, for performant memory accesses, let's say that thread zero, its first read, read zero is gonna occur at index zero. When that read occurs, it's gonna pull in a full cache line. So since it pulls in a full cache line, during the next um, read, we want thread zero to read index one's uh, value because that basically comes along for the ride for free since the full cache line's been read in. We don't want thread one to access index one's value. We want thread zero to access all the values within the cache line and multiple cache lines for performance. And similar behavior for the other threads that are executing in parallel and independently of one another. Now on the GPU, because of this um, warp, this uh, synchronization among the, the loads with, of the threads within a warp, what that means is we want, when if thread zero is gonna be responsible for it at, during its first read of reading index zero, we want thread one to read index one's location at thread zero as well, because this, this schematic here is only showing four threads, but we actually want a warp of 32 threads that are all pulling in consecutive uh, locations and memory at the same time because of this, this uh, synchronization mechanism that's required um, by, the, by the CUDA architecture. So the, um, the, the point is that for performance, for um, memory accesses, if you're in host space, you want those reads to be cached. And if you're um, performing, if your kernel is gonna execute on the GPU and your reads are being done in CUDA space, then you want to access, access, accesses to be coalesced. And as more clear definitions of what is meant by caching and coalescing, by caching, we mean that if thread T, so let's say thread zero, if, if its current access is at position I, so let's say index zero, then we want thread zero's next access to be at position I plus one, so one in this case. On the other hand, for coalesced memory accesses, if thread T's current access position is um, at I, index I, then we want the next thread's um, access to occur at the the consecutive position, I plus one. And so, like you would have noticed in that um, image I put up of some of the results from exercise four, uncoalesced access in CUDA space can totally destroy your performance by more than 10x. And um, that, uh, if, if we were to look back at that, you'd see the, the huge discrepancy between layout left and layout right in CUDA performance. So there, there is a, um, a comment here, um, if you have if you have read-only um, memory accesses that may um, be scattered, so you need some sort of random access, you have some sort of random access pattern in CUDA space, there's something that CUDA exposes to users called texture memory, and um, Cocos exposes this through a memory trait called random access that can, that can be used within the, as a template parameter to the, to the view. But that's covered in the advanced tutorial. We won't have time for that today. So moving on to an example to um, dig into this a bit more. If we're creating a view 
of data type double star that's going to have its allocation reside on some memory space that we're calling space. We populate this, this uh, view with some data, and then we're gonna call a parallel four where we're returning again to this summation over the array um, example. So parallel reduce, we're gonna sum all the values of those array and get a single uh, value as a result. So the question is, um, for example, with OpenMP, is this gonna result in cached memory reads? And on CUDA, is this gonna result in coalesced memory reads? And like before, since a lot of this stuff is at this point um, defaulted, it may not be clear what's, what's happening. So to dig into that even further, if we have P threads that are, that are working on this uh, kernel in parallel, which indices do we want thread zero to handle? So for contiguous access, we want thread zero to handle indices zero, one, two, up to whatever the range is divided by the number of threads. For strided access, we want thread zero to access zero, but then skip by a stride of n over p for its next access, and two n over p for its next access. And the contiguous access pattern is what we wanna see for the CPU for performance. The strided type of access is what's performant for the GPU. So question is why? So coming back to this, uh, this code snip again of this operator parens. Um, as users, we don't control how indices are mapped to threads, so how do we achieve good memory access? And with Cocos, this is done by mapping indices to cores and contiguous chunks on the CPU, um, or CPU execution spaces, and in strides for uh, CUDA. And as a rule of thumb, um, when using Cocos for, for some sort of a parallel pattern, the um, index mapping and the default layouts, they'll provide efficient access if the iteration indices correspond to the first index of the array. So we have a Cocos parallel four, there might be some range policy or some iteration range here. We have our lambda enclosing the computational uh, body, and our argument here is our iteration index. You want the iteration index to correspond to the first index of the view um, for the, the, this efficient access. And performant memory access is achieved by Cocos mapping parallel work indices and multidimensional array layout optimally for the architecture. So looking at um, if we were to use a row major or in Cocos jargon layout right type of memory access pattern, the kernel that we've been talking about, we're parallelizing over the number of rows of the, of the matrix where each thread is gonna be responsible for multiplying the row of the matrix times uh, the vector x. So with the layout right access pattern, this is gonna result in cached um, memory reads on, uh, if compiled with, with, a, with, with a, a host execution space like OpenMP or serial or threads because that'll result in the host space as the, uh, the defaulted um, memory space. With CUDA, this is gonna be bad because then we're gonna have uncoalesced memory accesses. So that's gonna kill performance. So with column major, as, or layout left as our, our access pattern, same thing, each thread is gonna be responsible for uh, a multiplication of, of a row of the matrix by the, the vector x, but if we're using the, the column major or layout left type memory access pattern, then with CUDA space, if we compile this for CUDA, we're gonna get nice coalesced memory reads because the threads, each thread, thread zero, thread one, thread two, thread three, so on and so forth, they're gonna be reading um, locations in uh, memory in, in, a, uh, in a nice uh, coalesced way. And so returning now for how to get some sort of nice default behavior by um, enabled where you don't have to control this all manually, if you create a view of type double star star in this case, this is for our, our matrix A, templated on the execution space, we're not explicitly providing the layout here. So what's gonna happen is the execution space is going to have a default layout that's identified for it that's gonna be performant um, for that execution space, um, or memory space in this case. So in our parallel reduce, if we're running this and we don't provide an explicit layout, what that means is if we compile this with CUDA enabled, 
CUDA space is going to be our memory space. CUDA is going to be our execution space. Even though execution space is provided as the template parameter in this example, the view will extract from the execution space its default memory space, which would be CUDA space. And so by default, this is going to have layout left as the memory access pattern, which will determine how these multidimensional indices are mapped to locations in memory. And so we're going to have good coalesced memory access reads when this kernel executes. On the other hand, if we compile with OpenMP as our backend, oh, just a second. Um, if we compile with OpenMP as our backend, then our execution space would be OpenMP. The default memory space with that execution space is going to be host space, and the default uh, layout pattern for host space is going to be layout right, which will result in nice cached memory reads. Okay, you had a question? Yeah, so just to be clear, uh, like this distinction is, is it a CPU GPU distinction or the specific backend for the accelerator? It's a, it's a backend distinction, but basically CPU GPU. So we could use OpenMP on a GPU, right? Yes. And then I guess you would still want to use this row major layout? Um, I think you would still want to use uh, the layout left access pattern. Um, that's a good question. We have a, an OpenMP target backend, but I'm not entirely familiar with the details of the implementation there. So I'll, I'll have to defer your question offline if that's okay, the answer to your question. Okay, and just uh, returning one more time to the results of exercise four that demonstrated this discrepancy in performance between memory access um, patterns. The case with CUDA, uh, when compiled and where the kernel is executed on the GPU using CUDA as the execution space, on a Pascal GPU, um, layout left, which is identified with a column major access pattern, gives us um, much better performance than a layout right or row major um, memory access pattern. And the reason for that is with the layout left memory access pattern, we're achieving coalesced reads. In the layout right case, we're not doing that. So our memory access pattern is not performant. However, with both cases of two different um, architectures for um, host backends, let's say, for example, OpenMP, we compile this, whether it's um, run on a KNL or on a Haswell CPU, the layout right performance, which is row major, is going to be much better than the layout left performance. Um, and that's because with the layout right case, we're achieving nice cached memory accesses. So this is the, I'm almost at the end of my time, and this is the end of the short introduction today. So that was a real fast kind of slam of some of the basic capabilities of Cocos. There's a lot of um, more advanced capabilities we didn't have time to, to dig into, but they're available on the, um, in the Cocos tutorials. There's different exercises for these. Um, and we're also available to uh, discuss this through GitHub. And of course, I'm here today during the, um, for the rest of the day and at the hands-on session where we can talk more about this. But some things, just so that you're aware of, that Cocos does have available um, are some capabilities for thre thread safety, scalability, and atomics. Um, there's a team policy where you can change your execution policy to use thread teams. Um, and that also exposes hierarchical parallelism where you can call a parallel for or a parallel reduce within a parallel for or a parallel reduce. There's a multidimensional range policy um, that's for tightly nested loops where you might have like um, for well, i equals zero to i less than ni, then for j equals zero, j less than nj, something like that. That type of uh, pattern um, you can replace using a multidimensional range policy and it's similar to um, an OpenMP loop collapse. There's a, a tasking pattern within Cocos and um, a portable thread scalable memory pool. And um, like I mentioned a couple times, the array layouts are extensible in Cocos if the existing um, options don't fit your, your algorithmic needs. And so I want to go over a couple points about the exercises. Um, to, if you gave them a try during lunch, that would be cool. But if not, um, just to help you get up and running if you decide to give them a try. So like I mentioned, you're going to be working on this toy example throughout the exercises, this inner product. And the first step in the first exercise is just to, to get this um, to include Cocos and compile with Cocos. So you need to include your Cocos header file. And then you need to include a call to Cocos initialize before you do any of the computations, and then a call to Cocos finalize before the, the return call. 
Um, there are some command line arguments that you can provide to Cocos, like the, the number of threads. You can also con control this through environment variables like OMP num threads. There's um, a Cocos num, numa option or the number of Cocos devices if you're gonna try and run with multiple GPUs. In that case, you would use um, a single MPI rank per GPU to manage that. And so in this first exercise, what you would do is look for comments that are labeled exercise, and basically you're gonna take the, the, um, the computation that exists and replace the, the for loops with uh, a parallel reduce. The outer for is gonna be replaced with a parallel reduce and then make it work within the Cocos um, API using lambdas. When you're compiling with Cocos, um, there's a make file that's provided, so if you clone your, uh, the Cocos tutorials and the Cocos repositories into your home directory, that'll make life a lot easier. Otherwise, you're gonna have to pass a Cocos path, um, you're, you're gonna have to provide a Cocos path um, setting for when you call your, your make. Now, depending on what uh, backends you want to compile for, there's this Cocos devices option, and that would be where you would compile for either CUDA, OpenMP, or Serial, but this also assumes that you have the, the necessary compiler support and architecture support to run that. If you look at the Cocos wiki, that'll give you options for different architectures that you might want to compile for. And I'm out of time, so thank you for your time. And if you have questions, we could talk more offline. <laughs>